Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel for our Family Bible Hour. Uh, welcome to the Christians from Brooklyn Bible Chapel as well and from Antioch Baptist and from many other churches. Friends, guests, any hackers who have wandered in, it's nice to have you too. I trust that today finds you and your family healthy, safe, and in the grace of the Lord. Does it seem to you that the uh, weeks are getting longer? I mean, this year, 2020, is a, is a leap year, so that February had uh, 29 days. Uh, I think that March had 100 days, and April maybe 150 days. Uh, nevertheless, we are still in week three of our series in Philippians. And if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Philippians chapter 1, and I'll put, also put the text up here on the screen. Now, I have opportunity to talk today with you about verses that greatly impacted my life uh, in my 20s. In preparing for this morning, it occurred to me that uh, Jim and Carolyn Dunkerton are back as part of our fellowship after 30 plus years uh, of, of, uh, of ministry at Emmaus Bible College. And Jim and Carolyn were central to the work at Hillendale Bible Chapel when Vicki and I arrived in 1980. Jim uh, scheduled the speakers and he was gracious enough to give me a chance, first as part of a series with some more experienced men and then a few individual messages. But Philippians was the first book of the Bible that I ever undertook to study in detail on my own and the first series of my own that I ever had opportunity to present. And then Jim and Carolyn went away, commended to the work at Emmaus, and now they're back, and they find that I'm still speaking on Philippians. And from their perspective, maybe this has just been one very, very, very long series. Uh, that was about 38 years ago. But today we have verses that continue to exhort inspire and admonish me every time I read them. On September 30, 1859, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to the State Agricultural Society. He had gained national prominence and was being mentioned for the Republican nomination for the 1860 presidential election. He told a story in his words of an Eastern monarch who once charged his wise men that they should invent for him a sentence which should be true and appropriate in all times and situations. The wise men went away, consulted among themselves, and presented him the words, and this too shall pass away. Lincoln went on to take issue with those wise men and spoke of ideals that he said, while the earth endures, shall not pass away. But this morning in our reading, we're going to find some words from the Apostle Paul that for a Christian should indeed be true and appropriate in all times and in all situations and to be kept ever in view. Our assigned text uh, starts in verse 19, but for connection, we're going to pick it up in verse 12. Paul writes, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole praetorium and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident of by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I, know that this, uh, for, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, 
that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, it means, uh, if, if, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, that your rejoicing may to me be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here in me. May the Lord bless, give it, giving us a good understanding of his word together. When this series was uh, laid out in 2019, nobody had any idea of what our state and our nation would be facing in April and May of this year. Yet these words seem to speak to our present situation. We are absent from one another. We'd like to see one another. Yet, though apart, we stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith. And we pray that even these current events will actually turn out for the furtherance of the gospel. Notice in verse 25, the little word, all. I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Now, it's easy to just flow over that as you're reading it, but the Bible rewards slow and careful study. Between last week and this, we have now read all of chapter one together. And looking back on it, notice how often the word all appears in this first chapter, and indeed, as we go through the book. It starts right in the salutation. He addresses the letter to them all. Other letters Paul addressed to the churches corporately, to the churches in Galatia, or to the church at Thessalonica. But here it's not to the church, but to all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi. In verse 4, he prays for them all. In verse 7, he thinks well of them all. They are all partakers of grace, partakers in grace, partners in grace, as we heard last week. In verse 8, he longs to see them all. In verse 25, he works with and encourages them all. Later in the book, he's going to rejoice with them all. He's going to tell them that Epaphroditus longs to see them. He closes the book with the, he closes the, book with the words that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. There's nothing quite like this in any of his other letters. This is a very personal book. Some churches Paul wrote to, he had never visited. He didn't know the Christians in Colossae or the church at Rome. He prayed for them, he cared about them, but he didn't know them like we pray for and care for missionaries that we don't know. But the Corinthians he was very close to. Last week, Paul Dumm talked about how they shared with him and provided for him. And the Apostle Paul said that they were the only church that did so. The church at Philippi is not comprised of doctrine and ceremony. The church at Forge Road is not a collection of ministries and meetings. Paul didn't know the Romans, and so he wrote to them a letter of doctrine. Paul was having trouble with the Corinthians, so he wrote to them a letter of exhortation and correction. But this letter to the Philippians is more than doctrine. 
It is more than instruction and exhortation. And if all we draw from it is doctrine and instruction and exhortation, we've missed the critical part. This book is affection. It articulates and embodies the concepts of unity and fellowship and oneness that we have with one another. Last week, we read in chapter 7, verse 1, I have, or in verse, in, in, I'm sorry, last week we read in verse 7, I have you in my heart. You are all partakers with me, partners with me of grace. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And again this week in verse 25, I shall remain and continue with you all for your great, your progress and your joy in the faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Last week, Paul Dumb related that he was once asked, what's the best part about being an elder at Forge Road? And I, I think he spoke for all of us. It is seeing people and seeing families together in the partnership of the gospel, partakers of this same grace. We give testimony to that in everything that we do, even in this present difficult time. In these weeks, you know, in these weeks, the, 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 the speaker could uh, record the message. We could record the opening. We could splice it all together, smooth out the glitches, add some music, post it to the website for people to view at their convenience, and, and that would be fine. But we decided not to do it that way. This is, this does get recorded and it gets posted on the website, but we decided to have this meeting at a particular time for this to happen live, even though there might be some glitches in technology or the speaker stumbles, because this meeting is more than doctrine and it's more than exhortation. It is the value of all of us coming together. And it is inspiring to me each week to think about you, to think about you, individuals and families, sitting down, clearing away other things, computers logging on, telephones calling in, coming together in the gospel. Jack just encouraged us to be calling through the directory. The elders and deacons have committed themselves to call through the entire chapel directory each week. As Paul says, as the apostle Paul says, that we would remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith. Now, every book in the Bible is inspired by the Spirit of God but the books are not written by the Spirit of God. The speakers or the writers are, are carried along by the Spirit. Every book is written to someone and is written by someone and to someone in some and in some particular circumstance, and it bears the marks of those circumstances. These verses in Philippians 1 give us an occasion to talk about how this letter came to be written, the circumstances of its writings. And understanding those events greatly enhances our understanding and our appreciation of the text. Paul, as he's writing this, is in trouble. He's in a lot of trouble. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul spoke of his experiences as, as an apostle in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, and fasting, and onward. And as Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians, he's in one of those times of tribulations, imprisonments, and tumults. Here in chapter 1, he speaks twice of my chains. He speaks of the praetorium. You might see it translated in, translated in your Bible, the palace guard. He speaks of being hard-pressed of wanting to depart and be with Christ, that things were a matter of life and death, and he speaks of the conflict that he says, you now hear in me. That doesn't sound good. He's in a lot of trouble. Now, for many years, indeed for centuries, the assumption by commentators and historians 
was that Paul was writing near the end of his life and during his imprisonment in Rome. The letter is usually spoken of as one of the so-called prison epistles with Ephesians and Colossians and 2 Timothy. But to some scholars, that just did not fit. And honestly, when I studied and spoke on this book back in 1982, it, it didn't fit for me for a number of reasons. First of all, when Paul was a prisoner in Rome, he was not in chains and he was not in a praetorium, not until the very end. What we call the prison epistles were not really written from a prison. They weren't written from a jail cell. Paul is a Roman citizen. He's not confined to some cold, windowless cell, chained to a jailer. But he was for two years in a private house, confined under house arrest, receiving visitors, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching them all things pertaining to Jesus Christ, no one troubling him. And that doesn't sound like it fits with Philippians. Also, the geography doesn't fit. Throughout the book, there's evidence of a constant, ongoing flow of communication between Paul and the Christians of Philippi. You sent Epaphroditus to me. I'm sending Timothy to you. You heard of my situation. I'm up to date with what's happening there. You send support for me, as we heard last week. Philippi was not easily accessible from Rome. I mean, to get from Rome to Philippi, you had to get to a port, you had to get a ship, you had to sail around Italy, then you had to sail around Greece, then up the Aegean, uh, then, then, uh, then dock at uh, Neapolis, then go overland. A journey between the two of them could take a, could take a good month, and, and, and that was even in good weather. There's no telephone, there's no text, there's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, there's no Morse code or Pony Express. If Paul's in a jail cell in Rome, how are he and the Philippians in such close ongoing contact? And finally, repeatedly in Philippians, Paul is confident that he's going to survive these current problems, come out of them, and see them again. Paul from Rome knew that he would never be released. He said that the Holy Spirit testifies that nothing awaits him but chains and tribulation. There's nothing in Ephesians or Colossians or 2 Timothy about him getting free and seeing the churches again one day. And besides, he had said that his work in that region, in Macedonia and Greece and in Asia, was done. The, re the region was planted thick with churches and that he was headed west. He told the Ephesian elders he would, they would see his face no more. How does that fit with these verses that we read, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Well, there has, in our time, been great advances made in archaeology and historical scholarship that help us to much better understand biblical times. You might remember in February, we had Rob Sullivan from the Associates of Biblical Research with us at Forge Road, and we talked about some of the new findings to help us understand the book of Joshua at that meeting. One of the really great things about being a Christian is that the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ are intellectually vigorous. There is this stereotype of Christians that we are anti-intellectual or anti-science, and that's just plain wrong and, and is frankly bigotry. Church should be intellectually challenging just as it is spiritually revitalizing. It should not be a theological echo chamber where everybody repeats the same mantra. It should not be a place where you check your intellect at the door and pick it up again when you leave. Rather, it should be a place of quickened and redeemed minds, educated and literate in biblical things, restless for knowledge, striving for a better understanding of Scripture and for a better understanding of the Lord, as Paul is going to write in chapter 3, reaching forward to those things that lie ahead, pressing towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There have, over these last 40 years, been tremendous advances in archaeology and historical studies that have helped us fit things together and see many things anew, and the book of Philippians is among them. Now, I know that some of you like hearing of the history and some less so, so I'm going to ask that you give me six minutes, to give me six minutes 
so that we can talk together about how and when this letter was written. And then I promise that we'll circle back to our verses. You'll remember from Norris Gorman's message that Paul reached Philippi on his second missionary journey. His first journey was to the island of Cyprus and then to the province of Galatia. And shortly afterwards, he wrote back to those churches. He wrote to them, he wrote to the churches in Galatia, the letter that we call Galatians. His second journey, which Norris talked about, brought the gospel to Macedonia and to Greece. Philippi was the first city in Macedonia to hear the gospel. Now, the third missionary journey was very different. In the first two, Paul was moving from city to city, never long in one place, from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea to Athens to Corinth. In the third journey, Paul goes to Ephesus, and he sets up in Ephesus as a center of the ministry, and he stays there for three years. Now, Ephesus was a big place. It was one of the four largest cities of the empire. Rome was the largest. Alexandria was second. And then Antioch and Ephesus are comparable. Antioch's just a little bit bigger. Ephesus was a great port city. It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia, what we today call Turkey. In it stood the awesome temple to the goddess Diana, the patron goddess of Ephesus. That temple had stood for 400 years. And it was the largest temple in the world. And I don't mean the largest temple to Diana. I mean the largest temple in the world. It was about three times the size of the temple built by Solomon. It was one of the seven ancient seven wonders of the ancient world. In pre preparing for this, I read uh, from an ancient, ancient travel log that said that you can see the pyramids, the hanging gardens of Babylon, the Colossus of Rhodes, the statue of Zeus. But when you see the temple in Ephesus rising to the clouds, everything else is in the shade. People came from all over Asia. They came from all over the empire to see and worship there. It brought immense prestige and an immense amount of money to the city. From Ephesus, Paul is training and developing men and women, and they are pushing out pushing out throughout the city, and then out of Ephesus as the gospel booms out throughout the province of Asia, preaching salvation and the forgiveness of sins by faith in Jesus Christ alone. In short, things were set on a collision course. In Ephesus, the irresistible force was pushing hard on the immovable object. After two plus years, Paul was confident that the churches there can stand on their own. He's anxious to bring the gospel to other lands. So he decides he's gonna make one last trip through Macedonia and Greece. You can see how close Macedonia and Philippi are to Ephesus. He's gonna make one last trip up through that region and then go to Jerusalem. And then from there, head west to Rome and beyond. He sent Timothy and Erastus ahead of him to cities like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and Corinth. And you can see from the map just the, 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 the way they would go from Ephesus up to Philippi and then into Macedonia. Paul would follow them shortly. And then Ephesus exploded. There was a confrontation fostered by the worshipers of Diana. You can Read about the, you can read the details in Acts chapter 19. Roman law was very tolerant to diverse religions, very into, but very intolerant to religious disputes causing public, public disruptions. The city turned into a riot. Paul was at the center of it. And the next thing you're hearing is the courts are opened and there are proconsuls. Proconsuls were Roman officials. There was one in every province. Proconsuls would hear and try cases against Roman citizens like the Apostle Paul. This was moving very fast from a theological dispute to a physical confrontation to an arrest and a legal trial. Now, please understand there's no such thing as an independent judiciary. Proconsuls are political appointees charged with keeping things in order and keeping commerce moving, kind of like Pontius Pilate was in Jerusalem. 
trial is not just finding facts and applying law. It was the, the management of the city and the province. The worship of Diana had gone on in Ephesus for 800 years. It commanded the allegiance of 90 plus percent of the population. It was central to the economy and the culture of the city. The gospel of Jesus Christ was this new, new thing imported from Judea, propagated by these Hellenistic Jews who cause problems wherever they go, who are not even welcomed in the larger Jewish community of our city, and who are here denying that Diana was a deity. Actually, they're denying that Diana existed at all. This would be like some guy in New York City defacing the Statue of Liberty. What kind of press do you think that guy's going to get in the New York Post? So what do you think Paul's chances are when this gets to trial? Whose side do you expect the pro-council to take when deciding what to do about this riot and, and how to make sure this never happens again? Ephesus was the capital of the province, and so it was the seat of the governor. The governor lived in a complex called the Praetorium, which housed his staff and his military officers, and it had secure places to hold important prisoners. A few months ago, we talked about the city of Caesarea, the capital of Judea, and the Praetorium there where Paul was held after a riot in Jerusalem. This is very similar. Paul was writing to the Philippians from a Praetorium. He says so in chapter one. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole praetorium and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Altogether, what happened in Ephesus is a very good fit with Paul's circumstances as he describes them in Philippians chapter 1, with the chains, the movement of Timothy back and forth, See how close Ephesus is to Philippi, and with Paul's expectation of seeing them again. This is from a um, 2019 article from the Journal for the Study of, New, of the New Testament, which is a peer-reviewed publication. For most of the past 2,000 years, nearly everyone thought that the Apostle Paul wrote Philippians while he was imprisoned in Rome. But since the 1990s, scholars have, be, have increasingly moved away from a Roman provenance and have considered Ephesus as the more likely point of origin. Okay, end of my six minutes. I related this not so much to explain the history, although I can only imagine how fascinated you must be as I envision you listening today. But rather, my point is to give us occasion to talk about verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. The imprisonment in Ephesus and the upcoming trial before the proconsul was an exceedingly difficult time. Paul describes it in his second letter to the Corinthians. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Remember that Ephesus is the capital of the province of Asia. That we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we, despot, that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. In week one of our series, we heard from Norris Gorman about the events in Philippi when Paul was thrown in jail with Silas. <laughs> this is much more serious. In Philippi, it was local magistrates who had no power over a Roman. Here it was a proconsul who held the power of life and death. In Philippi, it was local jail. Here it's the Praetorium. In Philippi, Paul and Silas sang hymns through the night. Here that same man said that he was burdened above measure, beyond strength. 
and despaired of life. In Philippi, the magistrates released Paul and Silas the next morning with apologies. Here Paul describes how God delivers him, delivered him, notice the words, from so great a death. What does that mean? In another of his letters, Paul dropped a comment about how he fought with beasts at Ephesus. And anything I could say about that is speculation, but it makes you wonder, was there some public arena? Was there a spectacle? What was the near-death experience that he survived there? Regardless of what happened, um, what was and remained impactful in my life as I studied these verses are the words that begin with this phrase, my earnest expectation and hope. Paul clearly has something specific in mind as he writes these words. I suppose it was his upcoming trial, or maybe the trial had happened and there was a sentencing to come, or maybe the sentencing had happened and there was some ordeal in front of him. We don't know. But he was gearing himself mentally and spiritually for it. But notice the words, as always. Philippians is written in the time of the greatest difficulty, the greatest test, the greatest uncertainty that Paul ever faced in his ministry. His situation was unique, but his attitude wasn't. Instead, he would face this challenge as he approached every day of his life. The situation may be more public and highly dramatic, but it doesn't require him or prompt him to change his mindset or rethink his goals. He's going to approach this and face this as he does everything else from the most ordinary day to the most dramatic, from the most mundane activities to the most impactful. As always, so also is this. He describes that attitude, that mindset, that goal, first in the negative and then in the positive. In nothing I will be ashamed, but that with all boldness, Christ shall be magnified in my body. A few weeks ago on Easter Sunday, we talked together about our bodies as just a tent not fancy, not permanent, and not home. There is more to you, there is more to me than this body with its muscles and tissues and bones and organs. The body is perishing. The inward man, the inward woman is the renewed day by day. That's true. But my outward man has one great advantage over the inward man. My body has one great advantage over my spirit. It is the only part of me that can actually do things. It is the only part of me that you can touch and hear and see. The Lord God can see my spirit and see my mind, but you can't. Now, the Google and the Apple have yet come up with a device for you to be able to see my spirit and read my mind. And by the way, if they ever do, there's no way I'm ever getting in front of it. If my spirit honors Jesus Christ, but the acts of my body dishonor him, well, that's what you and that's what all the world is going to see. This is at once the most obvious and most profound truth. My redeemed spirit may glorify and honor Jesus Christ, but the only way that you can see Jesus Christ in me is in my unredeemed body. The only way for me to show him to you is through the words, the deeds, the actions that come from this body. Everything I do is done in this body. So in everything I do, there is the opportunity to show the honor of Jesus Christ. Paul said that's his goal. All of his deeds, all of his words, to magnify and show the honor 
of Jesus Christ, always, and in this thing too. I have known Christians who are great athletes with bodies of strength and speed and grace and power who do easily what I could never do. I have listened to their testimonies when, of how when they train, they do so as an act of worship for the glory of God. And when they compete, they feel the power of God flowing through them. Eric Little, Olympic champion, missionary to China, whose story was told in the movie Chariots of Fire, said, I believe that God made me for a purpose for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. It's not just fun. To win is to honor him. In other words, the honor of Jesus Christ is seen in the exertions and the triumphs of his body. And I have known Christians of illness or accident or disability who struggle to do things that I do without thought. But like that Olympic champion, every day, the honor of Jesus Christ can be seen in their bodies. I have known Christians of advanced age, and their bodies just can't do it anymore, who truly are ready to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And Christians who face death unafraid, and every day, the honor of Jesus Christ can be seen in their bodies. An Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence to be ever in view and which should be true and appropriate in all times and situations. For a Christian, such a sentence does not have to be invented. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, answers the challenge of that monarch. It is true and appropriate in all times and situations that according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body. So if you have a big day before you this week with major decisions to make and many people are depending on you and all eyes are on you, then carry yourself so that the honor of Jesus Christ will be magnified. Or if your next days are ordinary with no public greater than your own family, then may the honor of Jesus Christ be seen by them in you. If things are going well or as well as possible in this present time of trouble, conduct yourself with the honor of Jesus Christ. If you are struggling or under a burden, or if you're helping those who are bearing some hardship, carry the honor of Jesus Christ in this also. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. If that is your guide, if that is your North Star, if that is your earnest expectation and hope, if you keep that ever in view, then everything else is going to fall into place. This is an individual commitment. It is an individual decision. We say often that salvation is a decision you have to make. Nobody can make it for you. Well, that's true of discipleship too. But as you make that individual commitment and set out on that journey, following that course, you're going to find that it's not some lonely pilgrim pathway, but one filled with many others whose minds and hearts are likewise quickened by the Spirit of God. And they will keep you company on the road, strengthen you when you're tired, encourage you when you're unsure, correct you when you're wrong, and sometimes carry you when you need it. This is the picture of the start of the 1994 New York City Marathon. 
the race starts going over the Verrazano Bridge. I'm in that picture. I, I know that it's hard to pick me out, but I assure you that I am in that picture. We weren't social distancing then. November 6, 1994, which Dolores Shetlick will immediately recognize as the date that is the 39th anniversary of the day that she became a mother. That was the first of seven marathons that I ran. God did not make me fast, but he did make me stubborn, which is a good trait for a marathon runner. I often think of those races, especially at the start, as an apt metaphor of what we, the Church of Jesus Christ, are. A large company of people drawn from every nation, every demographic, every walk of life, who each alone and yet all of us together, with focused minds, with hopeful spirits, and with disciplined bodies, set out towards a goal that none of us can see. So that striving together with one spirit and one mind in the faith of the gospel, we would together abound in knowledge and in discernment. We would together approve the things that are excellent. We would together be sincere and without offense. We would together magnify Jesus Christ in our lives until we all arrive together at the end of our journey on the day of Christ. Just one more thought, and then we'll be done for today. Just to finish the story. This is from Acts chapter 20. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now remember, this was the trip that he was planning before all hell broke loose, and I choose my words deliberately. He went through Macedonia, and when he got to Philippi, I'm sure that their rejoicing was indeed made more abundant by his coming to them again. Then he continued on, down through Thessalonica and Berea and into Greece, we read in Acts 20, verse 4, that Sopater Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trimotheus of Asia. And Acts chapter 20, verse 4 is a favorite verse of mine, and I've commented on it before. It describes what we've been speaking about these past weeks, the partnership in the gospel here are seven men, Sopatar, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timothy, Tychicus, Trimotheus, working together and traveling together. But actually, it's more than that. It's more than a partnership of individuals. It is a partnership of churches. It is Sopatar of Berea. It is Aristarchus and Secundus of Thessalonica. It's Gaius of Derby. He's a long way from home. Timothy from Ephesus. This is a partnership of churches. Ephesus was a metropolis. Berea was a small town. Thessalonica was Greek. Derby was in Asia. Each one with their own history each one with their own personality, each one with their own passions for ministry, each one for their own areas of excellence. All of us going together, all of us going ahead. And so may we do together until the day of Jesus Christ. So join in that race. Make that your goal and your North Star to honor Jesus Christ in your bodies, always, and then in the next thing also. Thank you for listening to me today. I look forward, as everyone has said, we look forward to being together soon. We pray for our city and for especially our first responders. I'll give it back to Bill for a hymn, and then to Jack, to take us out in prayer. Thank you for listening. The Lord bless you today.
Forge Road Bible Chapel, we are so thankful to be partnering with you in unity and affection during these unique and challenging times. We're encouraged that we can be together live at the same time, and we're grateful to be striving together with one spirit and one mind that we would abound in knowledge, approve the things that are excellent, be sincere, and hold fast to our faith. In the words of that Eastern monarch, this too shall pass, and we look forward to being together again in both body and spirit. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Father, we are blessed to have a body of believers wherewith we may comfort and be comforted by one another. We remember our church family this morning and their various needs from health and healing, wisdom for decision-making, comfort and loneliness, and help and finances. For all of these needs, Lord, and you know them, we make heartfelt intercession. Lord, we ask that we would continue to be thankful and of good cheer as we grow stronger in both character and faith, that in nothing we shall be ashamed, and that in all boldness Christ may be magnified in our bodies. And Father, we are also mindful to remember our first responders who work diligently for our safety and well-being, even when their jobs are difficult and often thankless. Thank you for their sacrifice to our community. And Lord, we pray for first responders and people everywhere who have not yet made you their Lord and Savior. We ask that you would put people in their paths so that they might learn to seek you first and honor you. And so now, Lord, we commit this time to you. We ask that you would preserve and protect your saints. We trust in you. And we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you today. Have a wonderful Sunday.